In Western science and Western philosophy, even in Western religions, we have always considered human beings as the masters of the earth. We think that all our natural world, all our forests and rivers, all our earth and animals are for us. They are ours and we can use them for our benefit. Even the environmentalists use a very rational, scientific, human-centered approach that we have to preserve the earth and its environment. We have to take care of the uh, forests and rivers and, and animals. But the reason that we have to conserve them and preserve them and take care of them is because we can use them for human benefit. So forests are a medicine chest for humans and, and, and so on. So uh, that is shallow ecology. Deep ecology goes a bit further and says Earth is not here just for us. There are 8.4 million species on this Earth and they have as much intrinsic value and right to be and live undisturbed, unpolluted, uncontaminated as human beings have right to live. So giving nature rightful place and giving uh, nature and recognizing nature's intrinsic value is the main idea of deep ecology. So there is a tree there. The tree is good in itself. Tree is not good because it is useful to humans. Tree is not good just because it gives us uh, a kind of oxygen or firewood or wood for the house or, um, or flowers or fruit. Tree has intrinsic value. River has a right to flow unpolluted, uncontaminated, undammed. And when we take something from nature for our survival, that is fine. That we should take with gratitude, not as of right, that it is our right to use nature. But we say it is a gift from nature and we receive it with gratitude and we reciprocate it by uh, looking after it, by composting it, by not polluting it and by uh, giving respect to it. I have gone even a bit step further than deep ecology. I have called it reverential ecology, which goes further in the sense that I consider nature sacred, nature divine. Nature is the uh, home of gods. Uh, so it is not only has intrinsic value and has a right, but it, it is also sacred. Sacred means it maintains life. It gives life to continue life. So it sacrifices. There is always, now for example, if you plant a seed, that seed is sacrificing its body, its independence, its separation, uh, becomes part of the earth and out of that sacrifice comes the plant and then the tree. So in the same way, every life, all life, sacrifice itself to maintain life and to continue life. That's the idea of the sense of the sacred. Life is sacred. Nature is sacred. And therefore, we must have a deep and profound and unquestioning reverence for all life and human life as well as other than human life. And human life is not more sacred than life of the plants or the animals. All life is equally sacred. So I go a step further than deep ecology and I call it reverential ecology. So from shallow ecology you move to deep ecology and from deep ecology you go even further and, and call it reverential ecology. So um, that way we don't see that earth is just for us. Earth it depends on mutuality, reciprocity, uh, interdependence, interconnectedness. These are the qualities rather than saying that uh, humans are here to rule over the earth. When you are creating a new world view and a new paradigm, your thinking, your language, your expressions, your way of communication changes because uh, the old world view depended on this idea that somehow human beings are superior. They have a kind of superiority complex because of the old paradigm thinking. And, and we are somehow here to rule over the earth. 
Now that language has to change and we are creating a new language of respect and reverence and sacred sense of the sacred and, and deep ecology. So this is a kind of connectivity. The, the, uh, the old idea, of, of which is old paradigm, is Darwinian thinking that uh, it is a whole natural selection, a survival of the fittest and, uh, and all species are compete with each other to survive. Whereas deep ecology and reverential ecology, even more so, says that uh, species are not in competition with each other to survive. Species are in a continuous dance of mutuality and reciprocity and connectivity. And that is an old Indian Hindu idea of dance of Shiva. If you go to Indian temples, you see the statues of dancing Shiva. Dancing Shiva is the nature of the universe. Everything is dancing with each other. The species connect with each other. So this eternal dance is going on uh, of connectivity, of interdependence, of mutuality, of reciprocity. So that is totally a different world view than this natural selection and, and a sort of evolution where people have come up with this idea of survival of the fittest and survival of the strongest. And that turns into a uh, social and political idea as well. And social Darwinism says that we have to compete in the world and those who are strong and wealthy and powerful can win. And that is where we, that kind of idea leads to war, to capitalism, to selfishness, to a cult of individualism. Whereas the new paradigm thinking of dance, earth is a dance of species and life dance of life gives a new uh, twist and it considers the whole earth as one uh, interconnected living earth, living organism. And that's where the, the scientific theory of Gaia uh, fits in very well. Because James Lovelock's idea that the, uh, it's a living earth and we are all part of this one living organism rather than competing with each other. So that also takes Darwinian idea of evolution a step further and creates a new worldview of uh, interconnected living organism as Earth. So I think that is very good. There are many, many new scientific thinking and scientific ideas and theories are coming up, uh, such as complexity and chaos theory and quantum physics and systems thinking. And uh, people such as James Lovelock, Fritz Jof Capra, Rupert Sheldrake, Vandana Shiva, all these scientists are working in the field to create new way of connecting with the earth. And that requires a new language, new expression and new way of looking.